David Bowie, it's lovely to see you. It's lovely to be seen. <laughs> Personally speaking, I have to say, I was in a blind panic about my age when I was on the uh, cusp of 20, but 50, how does that feel? Ironically, I don't think I would have thought about it unless so many people have brought it to my attention. Uh, I feel I feel awkward about it. I mean, it's uh, it's one of these things that I've, I've never done before. So it's like putting on a new suit in a way. It's like sort of you're getting used to it. I'm just sort of, you know, easing into the, the idea of it. I, I feel good enough to be able to say that I wish I'd been 50 years ago. <laughs> so it seems daft, but here in Neasden, I mean New York, um, there's not really a big age thing. It's probably more an English thing than an American thing in a way. In rehearsals for Madison Square Gardens, uh, yeah. you recorded some exclusive tracks for us, which we're delighted to have. We're going to hear them all in the next hour. Yeah. And we're going to begin with The Man Who Sold the World. What still turns you on about that song? I guess I wrote it because there was a part of, of myself that I was looking for. Maybe now that I feel more comfortable with uh, the way that I live my life and, and uh, my mental state and my spiritual state, whatever, maybe I feel there's some kind of uh, unity now. But that, that song for me always sort of uh, exemplified kind of how you feel when you're young, where you know there's a, a piece of yourself that you haven't really put together yet. And then you, you have this great searching, this great need to find out who you really are. Recorded exclusively for Radio 1, that's David Bowie and Superman. Well, that was very strange to do after all these years. I sincerely haven't done that for so long. Um... Interestingly enough, the riff that I use on that, the dum da ga 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 dum I actually revived on the uh, on the new album, Earthling. I used it on one of the songs on that. You gotta spot it. When I was uh, a baby, I did a, a rock session with one of the bands, one of the millions of bands that I had in the 60s. It was the Manish Boys, that's what it was. And the session guitar player on it, doing the solo, was this young kiddie who'd just come out of art school and was already top session man, Jimmy Page. And he just got a fuzz box. And uh, he used that for the solo. He's wildly excited about it. And um, he was quite generous that day. And he said, look, I've got this riff. He said, but I'm not using it for anything, so... Uh, why don't you learn it and see if you can do anything with it? So I had his riff and uh, I've used it ever since. It's never let me down. So, David, scores of top international celebrities were clamouring to wish you a very happy birthday. Including and we also, Fred um... Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm dreading this. We also asked them for a question. Robert Smith, I think, starts at ground zero. Hello, David. This is Robert from The Cure. Why did you choose the name Bowie when you changed your name? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear David, happy birthday to you, your dark ass fleas. You let me off very lightly, Robert. I'll give you a big kiss tomorrow night. Um, there was uh, a band in the mid-60s uh, achieving worldwide television fame called The Monkeys, and there was an uh, English guy in them called Davy Jones, and I was just Davy Jones at the time. And I just liked the idea of, one, that it was a Scottish name, and the other, that it was sort of images of the uh, Bowie knife and the, the, the idea that the Bowie knife was sharpened on both sides so it cuts both ways. I thought it was something terribly ambiguous about the name. So um, I opted for that. Many of your celebrity fans, I think, bottled out of asking you the question that they really wanted to ask, like a really tough <laughs> question. <laughs> Brett from Suede kind of got halfway there and backed down a bit. Well, he's tall enough for the job, isn't he? Hello, David. This is Brett Anderson from Suede. There's lots of things you could ask, isn't there? Um, tin machine or something like that. But um, I just wanted to know about one really brilliant song that I've always really loved, which is a very early song of yours, and it's always been one of my favourite songs, a song called Let Me Sleep Beside You. want to know what you think of it and why you don't play it. Have a happy birthday. See ya. How did you know about that song? I, don't, I'm, I guess it must have been released on something. Uh, da 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 bomb. Good riff. Thank you for reminding <laughs> me about that, Brett. <laughs> I might I might use that riff. I'm the ultimate recycler. It sounds like it might have been influenced by a Simon and Garfunkel, but gone a little heavier. I still thought I might have a chance of being a romantic songwriter, which never actually proved to be my forte. Do you really like that song? You are a funny bloke, Brett. You really are. <laughs> Here's a man who uh, once said that Ziggy Stardust changed his life. I think you would call him very reverend indeed. Hello, David. This is Ian McCulloch. Tell me this. Between the Ziggy Stardust and Thin My Duty is, how decadent did decadence get? 
Which song other than your own do you wish you'd have written? Have a great birthday. Love on you. Two questions there. <laughs> oh, that's, thank you very much for the questions, Ian. How decadent was it? Well, I tell you, some days I wore green and red. It got that bad. What was the second question? Which song do you wish you'd written? Oh, Lord. Uh, it, it's governed by the moment. The one that comes straight to mind immediately is uh, Shipbuilding. I think it's one of the most beautiful songs written. Stunning piece of work. Makes me cry, just the opening bars. Uh, specifically the Robert Wyatt version. I think it's just the most tragically beautiful song. I mean, I suppose you've had a pretty reckless existence. Did you ever think you'd actually make it to 50 and still be a sane man? I didn't want to make it to 50. It seems so unglamorous to want to be 50. There's a certain point when you're young, if you're nuts enough, you kind of go into auto-distract and you, you half want the whole thing to end um, because it's better to kind of go out at, like, 30 or dare you be 35 in sort of a, a ball of fire or smoke. But once I, I saw that I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't do that, that I sort of survived it all, I, I, it, then it became unusual because I'd never thought about it. I really sort of felt kind of redundant until I was about, I don't know, 43-ish, 44, and then I started to feel, though, that there might be some point in getting old. So how long does it take you to get over a serious night on the booze now, David? About 24 hours. <laughs> but um, I actually don't drink anymore, I'm afraid to say. I mean, I, I'm aware I'm talking to an English public here, but uh, I'm afraid it no more happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, I stopped drinking many, many years ago. And everything else is out. Which point did you decide, this is it, the booze has got to go? I think well, just waking up day after day, realising that I hated my life. You know, it was sort of you get to a point where you think, well, I can't put up with this anymore. Um, and I just did something about it. I guess middle age carries a terrible stigma in the I'm West, doesn't it? I'm over middle age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm long past that. But, you know, it's like the Sex Pistols got leathered for reforming at age 40. Um, Quite right. Is there anything that you wouldn't actually now dare to do at age 50? Yeah, quite a lot, but I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a really good question. No, I think I'm daft enough to kind of have a go at anything, really. <laughs> David, Andy Warhol, it's a role that you've already played once in your life, isn't it? And you've also chosen to uh, record an acoustic version of the track, from obviously from Hunky Dory for us on Radio 1. Tell us a bit about Andy. What fascinated you about him? I think it's the same kind of thing that fascinated um, every art student back in the 60s, the fact that this guy was uh, as well known as the work that he did. In fact, probably more people knew the name and the look of Andy Warhol than actually knew what it was he did. When I first met him, I took him this song and I played it to him and he was gobsmacked, I think. Uh, he absolutely hated it. And he, and he, sort of, he was really? cringing with embarrassment. I think he thought that I'd really put him down or something in the song, and it really wasn't meant to be that. It was kind of, a, I guess, an ironic homage to him. He took it very badly, but he liked me shoes. I was wearing a pair of shoes that Mark Bolin had given me, brilliant canary yellow, <laughs> semi-wedge heel, uh, semi-point-rounded toe, I remember, seven and a half, they would have been. Anyway, he liked those because he used to uh, design shoes when he was in his advertising, so he had something to talk about. Mick Jagger once said about you, you should never wear a new pair of shoes in front of David Bowie. I no. don't know what he was referring to. <laughs> I know why he said that. He showed me an album cover that he was going to do using an artist called Guy Pilar. And I immediately rushed out and got Guy Pilar to do my cover too. <laughs> he never forgave me for that. Because <laughs> mine was Diamond Dogs and I can't remember what his was. Repetition from the album Lodger. David, that's an extraordinary version of it. I wanted to pick a couple of songs that really were probably the least known of my songs. Particularly this song, I wanted to try it acoustically because it was so much an electronic piece of work on the album. And I wanted to see what it was made of just as a song when it was really stripped down and just became a, an acoustic piece. Um, and it's interesting to see how something that's really so minimal actually works quite well as a straightforward rendition. I know it's weird, but that's Reeves. What can you do with him? What do you think the David Bowie of 25 would have made of the David Bowie of 50? I think I would have driven myself mad because, I mean, I wasn't used to having happy people around. 
Uh, and I think I would have wanted to put me in a box and nail me in because it, I, I think I would be too exuberant for the 25-year-old. The 25-year-old, I kept very much to myself at the time and uh, I'd spend much more time on my own than I would with other people and I, I read too much. And uh, I think it's just the other way round now. Do you have a kind of favourite period when you look back over your career? I mean, a favourite hairdo or a favourite makeup <laughs> job, a favourite lycra cat suit, maybe? <laughs> I was never actually a cat suit. I think, did I wear cat suits? Or kitten suits, I think. I don't know. It's, uh, I, I, I always tie them to characters. I don't really think of them as just sort of outfits and stuff. I mean, for me, if I see an outfit from the past in, in some photograph, for me, it reminds me of the entire character that I was working with at the time. And uh, for me, <laughs> an outfit is an entire life experience. <laughs> I, you know, but it, it, it also is when, you, when you're younger, I think. I mean, an outfit is much more than uh, just something to wear. It's about who you are and it, it, it's a badge. It's, it becomes a symbol. A friend of mine, George, when we were real young, we used to, uh, we used to buy our shoes at... Uh, Denson's in Lewisham, just under the railway bridge, and we used to buy these things called. Uh, it was Denton's, but the shoes were Denson High Pointers, if I remember right. It's about '61, and we prided ourselves on being the first kids in the area to have Italian shoes. Winkle pickers, I think they were vulgarly known, but they're actually called High Pointers. Um, <laughs> and they, you've got a bit of a shoe fetish on the go today, <laughs> yeah, haven't I know. we? <laughs> I'm big on shoes, and then we were pipped by a much smoother guy in the sixth form called Gavin. I mean, even the name, Gavin, you know, he was so cool. He went into advertising. He had Chelsea boots. I mean, they were so kind of elegant because they weren't pointed and they had, uh, they had elastic sides. We were so crestfallen. I guess you were you were probably responsible for the hairdressing disasters of tens of thousands of teenagers. Disasters? Though, who decided to experiment with henna for the very first time to get the sort of Ziggy Stardust Well, more look. for them, they should have used... Now, what was I... What did I use? Ah, uh, Schwarzkopf, was it? So we're back to some top international celebrity questions. Um, <laughs> here's the boss from you too. Hello, space boy. Major Bono here. Can you hear me? Well, Can uh, you hear me? Yes, we do. Is something going wrong? There's something going wrong, all right. You're 50, and you look 15. You sound like you're having a good night. Is there night. a picture of you somewhere that tells the real story? You're Dorian Gray. And if there is, who would you have had painted? Happy birthday, David. You're a prince of a man. The world should kiss your arse. Thank you, young B. You can be first in line. <laughs> <laughs> He's a lovely little bugger. He's a very generous guy. He sent me just before Christmas. It wasn't a Christmas present. He just thought I'd be interested. He sent me two wonderful bios on Samuel Beckett. On one of them, Beckett's got a, a hairstyle that's not dissimilar to the one that I'm sporting at the moment. And on the inside, he said, this man's got your haircut and I'm sure he's got a pair of stilettos somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> he's a funny bloke. <laughs> Is there a photograph? There is, actually. Funnily enough, I did a thing on the internet today uh, and uh, I was going through photographs for it and I found this photograph that was obviously taken very early in the morning after some gross party back in around 1973, 1974 in New York. And there's me, David Johansson and Sorinda Fox lying on the floor in, uh, fast asleep amidst all this unbelievable trash and rubble. And we just looked like three totally finished, homeless, out-of-it meth drinkers. I mean, we look just... <laughs> it's, it's the most unbelievable photograph. It's, it looks like three people who had never picked themselves up again. <laughs> of course, not everybody wanted to ask you questions, David. Some just had a really sort of personal message that they wanted to deliver by carrier pigeon. Oh, no. Hi, David. This is Scott Walker. I'm coming to you via a very crappy old handheld tape machine, so I hope it's all right. I'm going to be a devil today and not ask you any questions. I'm certain that among the many messages, there'll be those about how you always embrace the new and how you freed so many artists. And this is, of course, true. Like everyone else, I'd like to thank you for all the years and especially for your generosity of spirit when it comes to other artists. I've been the beneficiary on more than one occasion, let me tell you. So have a wonderful birthday. And by the way, mine's the day after yours. 
So I'll have a drink to you on the other side of midnight. How's that? Well, that's that's amazing. Oh, I see God in the window. <laughs> <laughs> He's the boss, isn't he, Scott Walker? Um, You've absolutely got to love him. Damn, you really got to me there, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's, uh, uh, I think he's probably been uh, my idol since I was a kid. I... Uh, that's very moving. I want a copy of that. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it. You can take it away. I'm absolutely... Uh, that's that's really thrown me. That's... Uh, thank you very much. It's interesting to hear Scott talking about the way that you, you freed so many artists, and I think that's true. You know, of course, you were the first androgynous icon, and... These days, I mean, people think nothing of blokes in frocks and full makeup. I mean, everybody's done it from Kurt Cobain to Eddie Izzard, but there were times... I don't think much of it either. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But I suppose, you know, times were very, very different when you were kind of, you know, showing off your sexual ambiguity. I mean, I bet you couldn't stop off for a cup of tea anywhere north of Soho, really, could you, without being battered? Well, you could, but you took your life in your hands. I mean, I, I think, again, you know, so much of it runs with... Wanting to sort of be provocative, sort of making a point of being confrontational, that you kind of did it more out of bravado as much as anything else. I mean, the two feelings that were that, that were running through me is that one, that I wanted to make people aware of me. And the second thing was that I, I refused that I would have to live any kind of life that was behind closed doors and all that. In a way, again, reading, I've been fortunate enough to see how many people's lives have been so screwed up because they had to live their real lives in a, in a kind of a strange, dark twilight kind of way. And I just knew I wasn't going to ever do that. And I think, frankly, it was the right thing to do. I would still say that that is one of the most important things to do with one's life, is that you can't hide who or what you are. And uh, you'll enjoy yourself in the long run much better if you sort of come clean from the beginning, I think. Your influence has been incredibly broad. I mean, you feel it in the spectre of dance, in the rock and roll arena, and even in fashion. I mean, you must have killed yourself laughing a couple of years ago when all the supermodels were shaving their eyebrows off. <laughs> Yeah, I tell you what, I'm a, I'm a much more of a... F I'm a fan of music. I'm the ultimate fan. I get so excited about a, a sound that, that strikes me, that really sort of catches me and makes me dance inwardly, you know? It's like... It, it, it's, uh, it's a life force for me. Music always has been, and I always will be this kind of 12-year-old kid, I think. Fashion doesn't do that to me in the slightest. It's just stuff to put on. I see it much more as something that I just dress up the different characters that I still come up with. You know, I, I've, I've gone back to doing characters on things like the Outside album. Now, I enjoy it. I really do enjoy it. Now I feel a lot safer about it because I just don't become them off stage either, you know. I do think fashion is funny, really funny. It's so nonsensical. We don't have to do it. I mean, it's just one of those things like cuisine. You know, we just have to eat. We don't have to, like, put a little dress on it. <laughs> <laughs> Broccoli, you know, with a pair of stockings on it's totally unnecessary and that's what makes it amusing from the rise and fall of ziggy stardust and the spiders from mars this is lady stardust this i think is a really lovely song and uh it, it sounds really good even today I, li I like this one i think it's a good bit of songwriting i think it probably was one of the first songs that i wrote for ziggy i was trying to do this uh concoction based on a, an american guy called vince taylor who came over to britain it was totally out of his mind and uh, he was a failed Elvis type impersonator in America. But he went to France via England and made himself a kind of an Elvis over in France. Uh, and then one night, w went out on stage dressed as Jesus and uh, said that uh, his music was over and he was going to save the world. Um, <laughs> Vince is no longer with us, I'm afraid. But I hung out with him for a while when he was over in London and he was quite out of his tree. I remember one day that he took me down Tottenham Court Road and he had a map of the world and he laid it out on the pavement and showed me where all the Martians were going to land. And we were, like, kneeling there over this <laughs> map of the world in the middle of all the rush hour pedestrians. And I think, what is this bloke at? This is, like, this is... <laughs> 
this guy's out, he's out of his good. And then I lost track of him. And but he, I mean, somebody like that stays with you. And he became sort of the uh, the role model for Ziggy. He was one of the many. And then I pieced together bits and pieces of other artists, and they all became this rather grand, stylish lad, Ziggy. David Bowie with White Light on Radio 1, a live favourite of yours, David. I think they're all flinging their pants at you down the front when you kick off with that one, aren't they? <laughs> well, I think it's a lot of older girls who are throwing my pants back at me, ones that I'd left <laughs> in their rooms many, many years ago. The Velvets were probably, uh, again, along with Scott and uh, a number of others, the Velvets were really very, very big influence on me musically. A funny story about the Velvets. I told Lou this for the first time in rehearsals the other day. He could not believe this. When I first came to America, very early 70s, a friend of mine said, oh, the Velvets are working down at the, uh, I think it was the Electric Circus. So I went down there to um, I look at them, and they were wonderful. They did all my favourites. Heroin, you know, all the finger-clicking songs and uh, White Light and uh, Waiting for the Man and all those things. And it was so fantastic. And after the show was over, I went backstage. Lou Reed came to the door and I started talking to him about all the music and about how much of an influence they'd been on me. And I seemed to be the only bloke in Britain that had ever heard of them and all that. And, and we chatted for about an hour and he was wonderful, really, really nice guy. And, uh, and a week later, when I met my American friend again, he said, what do you mean you talked with Lou Reed? He left the band years ago. I said, but I sat down and talked. He said, no, that's Doug Yule, the guy <laughs> who took over. And I said, God, what? When I told Lou the other day, he said, do you know, I did a book signing the other week and I looked at the back of the crowd and I saw Doug Yule at the end of the line waving at me. <laughs> <laughs> Now I think Doug Yule has become more mysterious than Lou Reed in a strange way. <laughs> the enigmatic Doug Yule. I suppose we couldn't do a show like this without including some sort of token northerner. So here he is. Hello, David, you Cockney get. This is Mancunian Mick Hucknall. Tell me this. How do you react to music journalists when they judge your career? It's great to see people celebrating your music this way. I want to wish you a happy birthday and much success. And I think you're wonderful. <laughs> Well, I think you're wonderful too, Mick. Thank you very much. My immediate reaction to all that kind of thing is uh, is that I just look around my life and my group of friends and my family, and if I feel good about that, then I really don't have much to say about any of the rest. I've had such a wonderful life all in all, incredible experiences, and I've got away with murder. I really don't have any right to uh, be heavy on anybody who wants to judge my life, as long as they judge their own as well. And who else, I suppose, but one of the pet shop boys would have the brass neck to ask a question <laughs> like this? I wonder which one. Hello, this is Neil Tennant. David, do you regret saying in the early 70s you were bisexual? And were you actually bisexual at the time? I wish I'd said, Neil, that I was trisexual, but I never did. It was a joke that came too late. Trisexual? What does that mean, David? It means I'll try anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Neil. That kind of leads us rather neatly onto the next uh, set of questions, which are, of course, about sex, because everybody wants to talk to you about sex, David, really, I suppose, you know. But um, who was really hitting on you in those days? I mean, was it was it girls or boys? It was rather the other way round. I, if I, my memories, my, well, my memories never really served me well, but it serves me at all. I think I was hitting on everybody. I think it was that way round, because I felt that I had a real sex problem. I couldn't get any. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe uh, that for one minute. Uh, no, <laughs> you shouldn't, so you shouldn't. No, I had a, a wonderfully, irresponsibly promiscuous time. It was just heaven. Mm. Actually, it's not bad now. <laughs> <laughs> what about the worst sexually transmitted disease? Do you remember what it was and who gave it to you? I've never had one. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Let's hear some more music then from the Tin Machine era. This is Shopping for Girls. Obviously, Brett Anderson was kind of hedging his bets a little bit. He didn't want to upset you, David, considering that you're 50 and all. But, you know, he wasn't too keen on Tin Machine. I mean, how do you remember Tin Machine yourself? You were really belligerent about it at the time, as I recall. I'm still incredibly belligerent about it. Maybe No, I'm not, I'm not belligerent about it. I see it in a very different way from... Uh, uh, everybody else because I, I went through it and I know how much I needed that experience. I'd just given up writing towards uh, 87, 88. I was very indifferent to music. I, I, as I say, that was the my real 
period of crisis, I feel, that I just didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. I just made a major decision to plunge myself into something that was really the most unexpected thing that I could do, just to shake myself up. And it certainly did that. Publish and be damned. Recorded exclusively for Radio 1, that's David Bowie from uh, the Tin Machine era. Right, time for some more top international celebrity questions. Damon was going to ask you a question about your embracing of commercialism in the 1980s, but he bottled out. Hello, this is Damon. Happy birthday, David. Hope you're enjoying your own This Is Your Life. I've got lots of questions, but one which I've always wanted to ask you is uh, why you've never written a musical. You've always sort of almost written musicals. Anyway, happy birthday. I haven't written a hundred musicals in my head, but the thing that always puts me off is actually going along and watching a musical. It, they're always so bloody awful that I never actually finish one off. It always ends up on Broadway, and that's the most depressing thing about it all. <laughs> I don't know. I had in my mind there must be some way of working a travelling musical, something that works in rock arenas, and I guess that may be something that is maybe a last uh, working ambition that I would like to actually accomplish without it slipping into that awful saccharine thing of Broadway. So Ian McCulloch asked you a little bit earlier on, David, about uh, excess, and I think that's probably the subtext of Sean Ryder's question too. Hi, David, it's Sean from Black Grape. Are you still enjoying yourself, dude? Happy birthday, Dave. You're a cool dude, man. Big time. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you very much. Love the band. I really do. They're a very exciting band, I think. Yeah, I do enjoy myself, and uh, I enjoy myself probably within the realms of uh, more moderate existence. I have to say to you, one of my favourite documentary pieces that's ever been made about you is the Cracked Actor documentary, which I think is a magnificent piece of work. I mean... It did look like you'd swallowed a chemistry set, didn't it? The scenes in the back of the car there. I mean, what sort of combination of drugs were you taking those days? Did it look like one of Elvis's prescriptions? Uh, my drug intake was absolutely phenomenal. I was seriously addicted. Um, cracked actor is extremely painful for me to watch because uh, I, I know what my interior life was like and I was uh, unbelievably screwed up. I, I can't tell you how bad life was for me you know and i guess it's it's one of the ironies of having that kind of success is that uh, everything in a material level couldn't have been better my music's going down really well i mean i had a wonderful audience at that time throughout america it was uh, quite phenomenal and everything else about my life about me and about how i felt about myself was just awful absolutely the worst uh it was just uh, one of the worst periods of my life, the whole mid-70s period. I tell you what, though, I bet you had one of the most exciting bathroom cabinets in the Western Hemisphere, didn't you? So I've been told, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my old mate, my old mucker, Eno, always said it's... Uh, the thought process is something, it's, like, it's the aeroplane that you can crash and actually walk away from it. I don't put myself on the edge physically anymore. Because I like this old frame of blood and guts and I want it to remain r around for just for a little longer. Perhaps long enough to see some of the young contenders of 1997 really come into their own. I'm talking about, about uh, Placebo, who you've championed for a long time, David, and uh, I think we've got a word from them. Hi, David. This is Brian from Placebo. Now that we've done around uh, 10 gigs together and that we've opened for you several times, I would like to know when we're going to actually get a chance to collaborate on a recording because that would uh, make us very, very happy. Thanks, Brian. I think, I think they're a wonderful band. What Brian doesn't know, in fact, is I'd love to produce Placebo. I think I don't know why, but there's a lot about Brian and the way he works and what he's doing and his single-mindedness that really reminds me of me when I was his age. I think he's... Um, an extremely talented writer. I think his potential hasn't been met yet. I guarantee that they're going to be a major band. David, you were, of course, very famously and very seriously ripped off by your management in the early days. And, I mean, you should be a phenomenally wealthy man, and I assume you're not. I mean, you probably don't have to worry where the next bag of chips coming from, but, you know, I doubt you own your own sort of bijou cluster of islands in the Caribbean, do you? Um, I, would put, I would say that I, I'm rich, not wealthy. You are also, I believe, the first artist 
to float yourself on the stock market. <laughs> I feel like an air balloon. Yeah, I mean, what do investors get? I mean, are they looking for sort of used underwear or are they going to get a slab of royalties? I quite seriously never talk about my financial business. Oh, miserable guest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a nice story to have out there, though. So let's end today, David, with a couple of tracks for the fans. Aladdin Sane and Quicksand. That's a double whammy if ever there was one, isn't it? I'm so pleased that I thought about doing Quicksand. It was somebody in the band that said I should do it. I'd forgotten all about it. And uh, since I've done it for you guys, it's uh, I've started using it in the set now. I'm using it on stage because I've forgotten it. It's a really lovely song. I really like that one. And I'm, I'm really knocked out that uh, Smith is doing it with me. It's got Smith and Jones together at last. <laughs> David Bowie, age 50, thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, thank you very much for, for having me on your programme. I've really enjoyed it. Can the I questions ask... for Sufa, they were good fun. Can I ask you one more? Yeah. If you had the choice, if you could pick anybody in the world and you had one illicit birthday kiss to receive from somebody, who would it be? <sighs> i tell you what, i tell you what. Me at 80 and Iman at 70. <laughs> Magic. Thank you very much indeed. That was cracking. My pleasure.